Hello, hello. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Ball 2022, Queen's University, Belfast. Thank you. So if we can um, please get seated. Our program is about to start. Is my voice projecting OK? Yeah? Everyone can hear me? Great. I'm Dr. Sultan Turkan, the chair of uh, this conference. Um, I'm accompanied by my local organizing committee here in the room. Um, we have prepared a very welcoming opening reception for you here this morning. Um, we're going to start with the chair of the British Association of Applied Linguistics, Professor Zuhua. Um, she will welcome you to the conference, followed by our Pro Vice Chancellor Nola Hewitt Dundas, and, and followed by our head of school, Daniel Moos. And I will, um, and myself, my, my colleague Daniel McCauley, will welcome you to the conference, give you specifics about the conference. So, without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to uh, Zuhua, Professor Zuhua, to welcome you to our conference. Thank you very much for your uh, introduction. Uh, hello, um, nice to be back, isn't it? Uh, BAO 2020. Um, I'm delighted um, to welcome you on behalf of BAO EC Committee to this year's annual conference. It's our first in-person conferences in three years. This is also our first time in Northern Ireland as far as our record shows and also our first time that we host ISLA Europe Network Research, Junior Researchers Meeting. So we're, we've done well. For those who are less familiar with BAO, uh, who we are, we are founded in the 1960s and has embraced a broad conceptualization towards applied linguistics. We are now an uh, international committee community of more than 1,300 members working in diverse contexts, united in our conviction for the importance of language in individuals' lives and society. BAO is committed to working towards a fair and just society, with particular interest in the role of languages and language use in achieving this. Recently, we have engaged with a number of strategic priorities, including developing an EDI statement. EDI is uh, equality, diversity, and uh, inclusivity. We prioritized multilingual representation to decenter the role of English and to make other languages visible. We're also keen to support and connect the community and develop an international look as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and fight against nationalism, tribalism, and racism. Annual conference is a major highlight of BAO's activities. For BAO 2020, there is actual excitement of meeting colleagues and friends again after the most challenging two, two and a half years, as well as greeting many participants some of you, you may have met on screen only for the first time. And I would like to take this opportunity to say a big thank you to the local organizing committee led by Dr. Sultan Turkin for making this happen. And the Queen's University Belfast for providing facilities and support for the conference. And many colleagues here um, are from Queen's University Belfast and various sponsors, in particular, visit Belfast and publishers for your generosity. I also want to thank you, every one of you, for being part of this conference. Whether you are presenter, an audience, or supporter here with your family, 
I know many of you have traveled afar, and some of you have had to do, deal with flight cancellation, travel restrictions, and even family emergency. COVID-related disruptions and uncertainties continue to create many challenges for the logistics of a conference of this size. So we hope you can, we can count on your collegiality and support. Very importantly, uh, to keep everyone safe, we strongly recommend the use of face masks when and where you can. If you feel unwell uh, or have any COVID-related symptom, please take a test. And thank you for following this guidance. Finally, I hope you enjoy the amazing academic program and professional networking in the next three days. And let's catch up and look forward to the future together. Thank you very much. If I could have um, Professor Nola who would join us um, to the stage, please, to welcome all of you to our university, our Pro Vice Chancellor at Queen's University, Belfast. Good morning, everyone. Um, on behalf of Queen's University, it, it is my great pleasure and it's a privilege to welcome the British Association of Applied Linguistics Conference to Belfast and in particular to Queen's University. I believe that this is the first time that the conference has come to Northern Ireland. Um, and so for that reason, you are even more welcome and it's even a more special occasion. Um, my name is Noli Hewitt and Das, I'm Professor of Innovation Management and Policy and Pro Vice Chancellor for the Faculty of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences. As you can probably tell from the buildings on campus uh, as you've come in through the door this morning, the university dates back to the early 19th century, when at that time the Conservative government led by Sir Robert Peel, he founded the Queen's Colleges in Belfast, in Cork and in Galway. And the mission at that time was to supply the want which has long been felt in Ireland of an improved academic education, equally accessible to all classes of the community without religious distinction. Today we're in what we call the William Whitlow, Sir William Whitlow Hall. And it's a hall that was built to honor Sir William Whitlow, a medic, a politician, a philanthropist, and he was also pro-chancellor at Queen's. Interestingly, the foundation stone for this building was laid in 1939. The hall was completed in 1942, but the building was then requisitioned uh, during the Second World War to provide accommodation to the American forces so that it wasn't officially opened until 1949. I sometimes reflect uh, on the history and if, if buildings could talk, if trees, we often say, could talk, and the stories that they would tell of what has happened uh, in these spaces um, over time, of which the last few years has given us an example of just how volatile an environment in which we live. Today, Queen's is a member of the UK Russell Group of Universities. It's a pluralist institution that successfully models the kind of Northern Ireland that the peace process is designed to deliver. It is one of the most socially inclusive universities with almost 40% of our students coming from families with incomes in the lowest economic, socioeconomic groups. The university is an exemplar of fair employment. It's outward facing institution with a post-conflict perspective and it seeks to champion social justice. And this involves confronting our social responsibilities towards global society, as much as that to local and to regional needs within our local society. Reflecting the, the ethos of the university, it gives me great satisfaction to learn that the theme of your conference today is innovation and social justice in applied linguistics. 
Not only does this resonate with what we're seeking to achieve as a university, but it also mirrors the research interests of the TESOL team who initially developed the bid for the conference. The theme which was selected by the local organizing committee, it reflects their moral and ethical commitments, their shared beliefs that research should be rooted in real world practices and contexts. And I am delighted to see a relatively large number of papers in it that were accepted today in an attempt to promote inclusivity and increase engagement with international scholars at all levels of their careers. For us at Queen's, the aspiration of the local organization, or organizing committee and also the university is that the success of this conference will allow us to showcase the leading edge language research and activism that we have been doing here for a number of years. I would like to pay tribute to the exceptional work of my colleagues on the local organizing committee. Securing a conference demands a phenomenal amount of vision, determination and planning. It has taken over two years of planning to make this conference a reality at Queen's so on behalf of Queen's, may I thank Dr. Sultan Turkin and also her team, her, her fabulous team across a number of schools, including Mel, Ashleen, Yusut, Caroline, Ibrar, Jane, Daniel, Merrin, and Emma. Your work is really appreciated in making this happen. And I hope you take delight and pleasure in the conference over the next couple of days. The city of Belfast is truly a contact zone of language, of history, of politics and the arts with tethers that extend well beyond the geographic reach of the British Isles. For us, hosting this conference allows us to showcase this wonderful place that we are honored to call home and it provides Queens with the chance to lead global disciplinary conversations while at the same time drawing on our local roots. I'm confident there will be much constructive debate over the next few days. I wish you a most enjoyable conference at Queen's University Belfast. I really hope that you get a chance to renew friendships, friendships that have lay dormant for the last couple of years also to create new collaborations, perhaps the first time you've met people where it hasn't been over a Zoom call or a Teams call. Uh, and sometimes you look at people and go, I, I didn't think you would look like that. Um, but yeah, so you all resonate with that. Um, so the creation of new collaborations and a time just to be intellectually refreshed. How much do we need that in academia? A time to step back and actually remember why we got into these jobs in the first place. So you're very welcome. I'm delighted to have you here. I really hope the sun keeps shining and shows Belfast in the, the delightful uh, splendor in which we live. Um, and you're, again, you're very welcome and I hope you have a great conference. Thank you so much, Nola and Suha, for this very welcoming and warmest um, messages and, and, um, and sentiments. Um, so I would like to welcome our new head of school uh, at the School of Social Sciences, Education and Social Work. It's literally his first day at work today. <laughs> And uh, so he's showing up at 9 a.m. for our conference. That is a privilege. It's uh, an honor, uh, it's a delight to have you here. Daniel, thanks for joining us, um, please. Um, thank you very much uh, for having me here. And let me first say that it's a real pleasure to be able to be here at Queen's and be here opening this wonderful conference. First thing to say is, of course, I can take absolutely no credit for the organization of this conference whatsoever. That's all down to uh, Dr. Turkan and her team. But I am really delighted that we at the School of Social Sciences, Education and Social Work are able to host this conference. Our school is a large and multidisciplinary school. 
as the name suggests. We encompass a range of different disciplines, criminology, sociology, social policy, education, and social work. And we have over 600 undergraduates, over 800 postgraduates, and over 100 PhD students. This multidisciplinarity is, of course, very central to what we want to be as a school. And the area of TESOL and applied linguistics for us is really important in that. We've heard already about the importance of the field in relation to inclusivity, to social justice, and I see this area of work as one of the clear teaching and research strengths of our school. We have a very dynamic program. We have a very successful MSc in TESOL. We have a very vibrant PhD program. And we also have a real center of research excellence here in the Center for Language Education Research, which has a very exciting and broad program which encompasses areas such as uh, gendering in ELT, indigenous languages, um, culturally and linguistically diverse teaching, languages teaching across primary, secondary and further education. And that's why I am really delighted that we are hosting this conference. I think it shows the strengths of our school, it shows the strengths of this university. I'm also really pleased to be able to welcome you to this beautiful campus. I say it's my first day here, and, but as you will have seen, it's a really lovely place to be. And I think hosting Baal also reflects some of the strengths and principles of this university. There is a big commitment to supporting diversity, inclusivity, languages. There are a range of different programs and initiatives in this area. Think, for example, of the um, Irish language residency scheme, which we recently opened, which is allowing uh, students who wish to speak Irish to do that in their free time together. Um, think also of the great literary tradition of Queen's University. Um, Seamus Heaney, Philip Larkin, all people who have a Queen's background. And likewise, today we have many people on our staff who are published and award-winning authors and writers. So I think this is a great place to host this conference. I think Belfast is a great place to hold this conference. What you will find is that it's a friendly city. Uh, people will be very welcoming to you. But it's also, as you know, a really interesting place in terms of looking at issues of culture, diversity, language. And what we have seen in recent years is that there's been a growing interest in the non-English uh, local languages, Ulster Scots and Irish. And again, that's something that we would uh, want, wish to encourage and wish to develop in our university. So I'm not going to keep you waiting any longer, just to say, on behalf of the School of Social Sciences, Education and Social Work, a very big welcome to you, and we are really delighted to have you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you so much for this welcoming message. And, um, well, um, you have been welcomed so many times, right? Um, You're very, very welcome to Ball 2022 at Queen's University, Belfast. Um, warmest welcome to um, all the first time attendees. Um, who here is attending Baal for the first time? Can we see hands? Wow. So, would you be bold to stand up or turn to your uh, neighbor and, and, and um, acknowledge your na neighbor, maybe in the form of a nod, maybe in the form of a hello, maybe in the form of a... Um, hi, what are we doing here? I have no idea. Um, yes. Warmest welcome um, to, to first time and long time attendees. And I hope that throughout the conference you get to be in that very dialectic place, that interactive place. I'm Sultan Turkan, chair of the first in-person Baal conference after two years of online conferencing. I am proud and delighted 
that my team and I brought this year's conference to you. I would like to first acknowledge the ground I'm standing on, and that's the local organizing committee. Uh, this conference would not have been possible without the committee, without my people, I will, I will say. Um, I will ask e each one of the committee members to please stand up and wave hello, make uh, themselves seen and, and, and recognized. Dr. Mel Engman. <laughs> you can stand up more. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, I'll say names. Yes, Dr. Mal <laughs> Dr. Ashling O'Boyle. <laughs> Dr. Sing Wang Chang. Sing Wang, come, come closer. Come closer. Come to the. Come to the front, please. Thank you. That, that was a marathon. <laughs> um, Dr. Yesid Ortega. <laughs> Dr. Ibrar Bhatt. <laughs> Dr. Caroline Lindsay. I don't, I don't think Caroline is here this morning. Um, Dr. Jane Luge. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Manuel, Daniel McAuley. Dr. Marion Davies Deacon. <laughs> Dr. Emma Humphreys. <laughs> By all means, please acknowledge them with your thank yous today and throughout the conference. I would also like to acknowledge our finance team, Claire Shannon and Eileen Gray for all their help, and Eventus team who is on site here um, helping you with the registration desk. Also, our wonderful volunteers, you will see them uh, with their distinguished designer t-shirts um, that says volunteer. Uh, a massive thank you, a massive thank you to our volunteers. Please make yourself seen. Please come to the front. Um, and uh, <laughs> Come on, guys, come on. Come on to the front, yeah. <laughs> these, these folks will be... These folks will be in the rooms today at the conference venue. Um, they will be stationed in the rooms and helping you with all kinds of, um, hopefully, uh, accomplishments, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, yes, come on, come on. Oh. <laughs> please, please, by all means, um, say thank yous to them and acknowledge, yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Zichan. Thank you, Gunnahar. Thank you. Um, so I address you today as a lecturer in bilingual education. Mostly, I address you from a scholarly positionality representing the global south. With that positionality and the conference team being on social justice and innovation in applied linguistics, I'm here to first off acknowledge the complicated relationships some or perhaps most of us in this room have with the field of applied linguistics. In that, we would need to take stock and see how the field of linguistics has historically been, been entangled with colonization and decoloniality at the same time. This simultaneity of being pulled in multiple different directions is reflected in what applied linguistics does and has done in its roots and origins. Often being stuck in binaries such as language, nation, culture, nature, standard, non-standard, varieties of language, correct, incorrect notions of language, as well as mind-body binaries. We can add many more binaries to this list, pulling us 
all in opposite directions at the same time. The binaries might then get reflected in everyday language use and how the intersections of race, religion, ethnicity, age, disability, appearance, sexual orientation, and place all get encapsulated in language and through language. I hope throughout this conference you get to ask many questions that you may not have asked before or you didn't think of asking before. Various questions, various questions uh, come up for me as I look through the conference program and the papers we accepted. For, is, for instance, what is social justice when study of and study on language pull us in so many directions? How do we rise to the occasion and see through challenges and turn them into innovative opportunities in addressing global, structural, natural, and epidemic forces? How do we reflect critically on language variation, multilingualism, language policy, the relationship between language, discourse, ideology, and identity, and the role of language in relation to social justice, sustainability, and climate change discourses? That was a mouthful. <laughs> yeah. I said a lot. How do we problematize traditional approaches to language research? How do we push for methodological and conceptual innovations? These are all questions that are alive for me. Um, and, and it's important to stay there and not necessarily beg for answers. I'm proud to announce that close to 300 papers, including poster and colloquium papers, were registered at this conference in a wide range of research topics, including the status of English language, social justice, language and symbolic power, um, multimodal analysis, language coloniality, decolonization, gender relations, linguistic reclamation, among many others. Conference program leaves me personally with reflections on what innovative social justice means. Here are some inspirations that I thought I would like to share this morning. For me, gleaning and, and, and drawing on reflections from this conference. Um, social justice means being connected to one another, to the land, to one's self, to the human condition of suffering. It means awareness of what's going on around us and within us. And coming to say enough is enough. Refusing not just resisting, mind you, to be marginalized, refusing to be ostracized, elbowed out. It doesn't just mean inclusion, because it positions some in power to exclude or include the other. It means understanding oppression, and most importantly, feeling and sensing into what it means to be oppressed, what it means to oppress. It means being with the many in one, being the one containing the many, recognizing the unity in diversity, recognizing I am, therefore you are, recognizing you are, therefore I am, we interbe. This idea of interbeing is very alive for me, has been for a long time. It's best captured, the idea of interbeing is be best captured in the poem written by the peace activist, late Vietnamese Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh, 
The poem is called, Please Call Me By My True Names. So I will, if you will indulge with me, please, I will share this poem. Don't say that I will depart tomorrow. Even today, I'm still arriving. Look deeply, every second I am arriving to be a bud on a spring branch, to be a tiny bird with still fragile wings, learning to sing in my new nest, to be a caterpillar in the heart of a flower, to be a jewel hiding itself in a stone. I still arrive in order to laugh and cry, to fear and to hope. The rhythm of my heart is the birth and death of all that is alive. I am a mayfly metamorphosing on the surface of the river. I am the bird that swoops down to swallow the mayfly. I am a frog swimming happily in the clear water of a pond. And I am the grass snake that silently feeds itself on the frog. I'm the child in Uganda, all skin and bones, my legs as thin as bamboo sticks. And I am the arms merchant selling deadly weapons to Uganda. I'm the 12 year old girl, refugee on a small boat, who throws herself into the ocean after being raped by a sea pirate. And I am also the pirate, my, my heart not yet capable of seeing and loving. I'm a member of the Politburo with, with plenty of power in my hands. I am the man who has to pay his debt of blood to my people dying slowly in a forced labor camp. My joy is like spring, so warm. It makes flowers bloom all over the earth. My pain is like a river of tears, so vast it fills the four oceans. Please call me by my true names so I can hear all my cries and laughter at once. So I can see that my joy and my pain are one. Please call me by my true names so I can wake up and the door of my heart could be left open, the door of compassion. I hope you enjoy your conference in this very spirit of interbeing. I want to welcome my colleague now, who is the Master of Ceremonies uh, for today's conference. Um, and thank you. Morning, everybody. I'm afraid I have to bring us back down from poetry to practicality for a couple of moments. Um, I have a couple of announcements to make before we get into the main business of the conference. The latest version of the conference program is available on our website. This reflects a number of minor changes and cancellations since the materials in your conference packs were printed. Uh, so please do consult this for the most up-to-date uh, schedule of events. Any further changes will be posted on the notice board on the website and on the signage on the doors of uh, presentation rooms. Um, I'll briefly run through the outline of today's program, noting special events in particular, and I'll finish off with a brief announcement on health and safety procedures here in the Whitla Hall. So we'll start the day with the Pitt Quarter Lecture from Professor Ahmed Mahboub in a few moments now at 10 a.m. here in the Whitla Hall. We'll then move over to the Peter Froggett Center for the first block of parallel sessions starting at 11.30. Volunteers and LOC members will be able to help you find your way there. Um, lunch will be served back here at the Whitla Hall from 12.30 to 1.30. And during that lunch are the annual general meetings of the language policy and intercultural communication special interest groups will also be held. 
Uh, we'll then have our second block of parallel sessions in the Peter Froggat Center from 1.30 to 3 p.m. During that block, there are two special events, the Local Organizing Committee's Colloquium on Language and Place, and the Postgraduate Research Forum. Please take a look at the program booklets for further details on those two events. Um, we'll then uh, have a tea and coffee break back here in the Whitla Hall uh, until 3.30. From 3.30 p.m. until 5, we'll have the final set of parallel sessions and the Committee for Linguistics and Education Roundtable will also take place during that slot. At 5 p.m., we'll return here um, to the Whitla Hall for Professor Lee Wei's plenary talk, and we'll round off the day with the Baal Book Prize event and a buffet dinner uh, from 6 p.m., and that's also here in the Whitla Hall. So if there's food involved, it's going to be here. If there's most <laughs> of the parallel talks uh, will be in the Peter Froggatt Center. Uh, you should have received login details for access to the EduRoom Wi-Fi network by email. But if you're having issues connecting to that, please try the alternative network called the cloud. And if you're still having problems, visit the registration desk for assistance and we'll see what we can do. Um, <clears throat> we have arranged a quiet room for all three days of the conference. You'll have received the details of that space on the ground floor of the Lanyon building, the main building uh, here at Queens, um, for Friday and Saturday in your joining instructions. Uh, those are also on the website. If, uh, if you can't access that email. Um, for today, we've got a different uh, quiet room in the same building where the parallel sessions take place. Um, so please use the Peter Froggatt Center room 01024. Uh, you'll get to know where that is uh, over the course of the day, I hope, um, on the first floor of the Peter Froggatt Center for that purpose. Uh, Weather permitting, you can also take a break from the, the hubbub of the conference in the Botanic Gardens, which are just next door. There's an entrance behind us here and down at the uh, bottom of campus. Toilets, uh, including accessible toilets, can be found to the left and right of the entrance hall um, uh, in this building. And they're well si signposted on each floor of the Peter Froggatt Center. If in doubt, please ask a volunteer who should be able to help you find your nearest option. With any other queries, please feel free to approach our volunteers in the Black Bal Conference t-shirts. Um, LOC members whose photos you can find in the conference booklet and who have all waved at you um, earlier today. Um, or come to the registration desk. Uh, the delivery of custom conference tote bags was delayed uh, due to a parcel service strike. Um, but we hope that you'll be able to return to the registration desk before the end of the uh, conference for some custom swag. If you're tweeting uh, about the event, please use the hashtag BAL2022. Um, a feed of tweets will also be visible on the website notice board. Okay. We're conscious that COVID is an ongoing concern and the delegates are coming from a variety of contexts. We have some masks available at the registration desk and sanitizer will be available um, in the presentation rooms and elsewhere on campus. Um, local registration regulations do not require that masks be worn, but we'd ask delegates to be cognizant of the concerns of others um, and to be vigilant if they suspect they may be developing symptoms of COVID. Um, we recommend that masks be worn when appropriate uh, during the conference. I'll finish with a short safety announcement for the Whitla Hall. Uh, similar information for the other venues is uh, available in the presentation rooms in the Peter Froggatt Center. Um, but for here, um, if you hear the fire alarm, we would ask everyone to evacuate the building immediately. Please leave in a calm and orderly manner using the exits which are located at the front and the rear of the hall. Then make your way to the assembly point uh, at the front of the physics building. Uh, located at the car park side of the hall opposite the main building. That's in that direction as you leave this building. Um, we would ask you to remain there un until otherwise instructed. Uh, please do not attempt to re-enter the building even if the alarms have been silenced as this does not always mean that the emergency is over. Thanks very much for your cooperation. We're pleased to welcome you to Queen's University and we hope you enjoy the conference.
thanks so much, Daniel. So we have um, about five minutes or so before uh, we transition to our pit quarter lecture by Professor Ahmar Mahbub and my colleague, Dr. Mel Engman, will introduce um, our speaker this morning. So um, we allow five minutes for everyone to stretch or, or, or should we start? Okay. Okay, so um, my colleague, my colleague is ready, so <laughs> Dr. Malengman to introduce our speaker, Professor Ahmar Mahbub. Thank you. You can stretch too. Jidi, Anim, hello to all of you. So I'm Mel Ingman, I'm a lecturer uh, in education here at Queen's University Belfast. I'm originally from the Great Lakes region of the United States, um, and I feel lucky to call Belfast my home now. It's really a pleasure to welcome all of you to Ball's annual conference, and it's an honor to introduce our plenary speaker for the Pitt Quarter Lecture. Um, associate Professor in the University of Sydney's School of Letters, Arts and Media and their Department of Linguistics, Sunny Boy, Prof Nomad, Dr. Ahmar Mabub. So Sunny Boy did his undergraduate and master's degrees at the University of Karachi. Then he moved to the North American continent where he did a PhD in linguistics at the University of Indiana in Bloomington. He taught in higher education in the United States before relocating to yet another continent, joining University of Sydney's Department of Linguistics. Since then, Sunny Boy has become a leading voice in critical research that addresses issues at the intersection of language and power, which includes a tremendous amount of creativity and reflection as his own work explores the inequities and mythologies of our own discipline. His research, writing, and speaking engagements problematize dominant conceptions of what language is. His current work echoes and builds on the sentiments behind Sinfrey McConey and Alistair Pennycook's assertions in the early 2000s that language and the metadiscursive regimes used to describe it are colonial inventions. Sunny Boy extends this criticism to learning more broadly as he relies on observations of the world around us to theorize the relationships between language practice, whatever that is, and knowledge creation. Uh, in a recent interview for Japan's Association of Language Teaching in 2021, Sunny Boy distills this idea down into a simple question. He asks, how do we create knowledge of the world through our sensory systems? And while he acknowledges that language is one of those ways, he refuses to rule out other possibilities that might currently fall outside our canon. This resonates with my own observational and experiential scholarly sense-making, researching with bilingual Ojibwe youth, elders and land in North American forests. There's really nothing like a walk in the woods to remind you of the shortcomings associated with focusing solely on speech and writing for knowing and relating with humans and non-humans in the natural world. Uh, Sunny Boy has written extensively about the ways in which colonialism, capitalism, and globalization shape language in use, particularly in educational contexts. He has conducted research on language varieties, language and identity, language pedagogy, language and spirituality, and language and the environment, just to name a few of his interests. Um, a former editor of TESOL Quarterly, he's published this work in international journals such as World English's International Review of Applied Linguistics and Language Teaching, Linguistics and the Human Sciences, Writing and Pedagogy, Aboriginal, the Journal of Indigenous Studies in First Nations and First Peoples Cultures, and Journal of Postcolonial Cultures and Societies. His research and activism have taken Sunny Boy all over the world, researching English teaching, learning, and use in Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, the United States, Cape York Aborigines, and always, he researches and co-authors with a careful attention to how power operates within and on the local context. In his authored and edited books, such as The NNEST Lens, Non-Native English Speakers in TESOL, Appliable Linguistics, and uh, Spirituality in English Language Teaching, Religious Explorations of Teacher Identity, Pedagogy, and Context, 
Sunny, help, Sunny Boy helps the readers to recognize and then move beyond our colonial assumptions. He cautions against uncritical trust in theory that doesn't mesh with observable languaging practices, particularly in places that the global north tends to overlook. Sunny Boy does this especially well in his free open access book, Subaltern Practice, A Practical Guide, that models new tools and resources for research that successfully enacts change in the world through subaltern education. What's more, Sunny Boy's insistence on developing methods and theories that make education more accessible for everyone have led him to explore alternative genres of representation, because we may occasionally forget that academic writing is not the only way to show what you know. So what does inquiry-based knowledge production look like in a poem? Sunny Boy might just know. He was inducted into the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame in 2021. The recipient of the President of Pakistan's award for highly qualified overseas Pakistanis twice. And in 2019, he was recognized as the field leader in English language and literature by the Australian's research magazine. We are so fortunate today to have scholar and activist and advocate of his caliber here with us, presenting his talk titled Applying Linguistics. It's my pleasure to introduce the speaker for this year's Pitt Corridor Lecture, Dr. Ahmar Maboub, Prof. Nomad, Sunny Boy. Thank you so much, Mel, for that introduction. Now I'm really nervous. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, for inviting me to this first face-to-face -face conference for me as well in multiple years. I'm really excited to be here. Now, I'll just start right on. I think the first thing we can do with applying linguistics is trying to figure out how we name things. And notice I've got three names. So I've got three of me here, right? I've got Ahmar Mehboob, which is my birth name. Now, Prof Nomad is my, one of my writing names that I started using about four or five years ago. And people already always ask me, what does it mean? What, why Prof Nomad? You notice it's not Professor Nomad, it's Prof Nomad. Now, it's partly because Prof Nomad is making sort of fun of the idea of professors. But also notice, he's, it's not the mad professor, it's the nomad professor, right? <laughs> it's the professor who's nomad but it's also a nomadic life because I live a nomadic life and I've lived a nomadic life for generations. So that sort of captures an essence of who I am in the way that I want to project my work. Now, Sunny Boy Brumby is, is a different name altogether. Now, about two years ago, my life and my, because I was born a child of refugees and modern day slaves, I you know, struggled with a lot of things across my life. And I, at the point in my life, I was like, literally to the point I was thinking of committing suicide. And of course I said, that's stupid. I won't do that, I, I can't. So I said, what do I do to reboot myself? So what I did was I committed a sociological suicide. So I killed myself sociologically. And that's part of the reason I don't use Ahmer Mehboob really very often. I go by Sunny Boy. Now at about the same time, I was lucky enough to be adopted as uh, into the indigenous family in Cape York, Aboriginia which is Aboriginal lands, and my adopted mother gave me the name Sunny Boy. Uh, so that's why I go by Sunny Boy. Brumby I chose myself. Now, I, I don't know if you know what a Brumby is. Brumbies are the wild horses in Australia. Now, there were no horses in Australia, and the horses were brought by the English when they started colonizing the land, and Australia is still a colony, it's occupied lands. So over time, the horses either ran away or were released, and they became the wild horses known as Brumbies. So in a sense, I see myself as a Brumby because I went to Australia as a workhorse, and I worked, and I worked, and I worked, and then I ran away into the bush, and I, I, I became part of the Aboriginal and the Indigenous family. So in that sense, I'm Brumby, <laughs> right? So you can see language can actually be applied in how we create ourselves and recreate ourselves and how we project different sets of identities for ourselves. Now, I'll start the session formally with actually a poem. Uh, this is a recent poem that I wrote. It's called Language. Uh, I'll have to read it from the screen. Like computer languages, or like computer languages program machines, human language programs people. 
And while we do have other senses, language can shape how we use those too. Language co-evolved with where she grew, with lands, creatures, and seasons she knew. Our elders learned all that was needed and taught it to us through boli and practice. The flow of sounds, the melodies of song, the rhythm of knowledge, the grammars of dance, the meaning of colors, the semantics of smell, the discourse of flavors, the sense of touch. A harmonic system in a mystical garden. All that was, all that changed when her tongue was cut, our laws replaced by foreign words, our knowledge drowned in information floods, our wisdom stolen through tests and books, our traditions slaughtered by trends and feds, our integrity murdered with greed and wants, our humanity turned into an infectious wound, an agitated system in a turbulent existence. So you see, its poem is about language. And I want to highlight how the point of this is the idea of co-evolution of language with our environment and our context. Language, in a sense, represents the geographical experiences of our heritage. And it grows in relation to land and environment. And by shifting the languages and taking them away, we essentially deharmonize the populations. And we deharmonize the way that humans interact with nature and other beings. Now, this is done often through education, and unfortunately, it has been done through the discipline of linguistics that we are all part of. Now, why do I say that? To understand that, let's look at a few examples. Uh, some of you would, have know, you would know this book. You might have used this book uh, in teaching, or you might have used it as a student. It's a very commonly used book. Now, what I want to highlight here, and I'll give you another example as well. The same, another example is here, Fessel's one. Both of them are introductory textbooks to linguistics, very commonly used around the world. Now, in both these textbooks, what you notice is the textbooks start by separating out human language with non-human communication. So humans have language, non-humans have communication, right? Notice the discipline is doing it. It is a discipline of linguistics that's creating a distinction between human language and non-human communication. And because we as students of language have to study these books and then we have to take exams and we have to write term papers, we turn this into a belief system. We all start believing that humans have language and then there's non-human communication. But for a second, if we move away from this reference-based thinking and observe the world that we live in, we will realize that there is hardly any reality behind any of this stuff. It doesn't, it's that distinction, that categorization of language versus communication doesn't exist in the natural world. Now, to understand it really best, I actually had to go back to my own mother tongue. In my mother tongue, we actually don't have a word called language. We use the word language from English. We borrow it. In my own mother tongue, we have a term called boli. And boli in English is speech. And boli is not restricted to humans. We say a cows can have boli, sheep have boli, trees have boli, birds have boli. Everything has boli. So when I look at my own mother tongue, I am not confused. This confusion doesn't exist for me. It is a created confusion that comes through academia and comes through the discipline of linguistics, which we are applying in our own work, whether it's in TESOL or applied linguistics. So we see that the foundations of linguistics are here really shaky. And this is part of where it comes from a colonial and coloniality and enabling uh, discipline, right? That is the history of where linguistics comes from. And, you know, it's interestingly enough, linguistics and applied linguistics as disciplines, as departments within the university are a very new thing. 
Linguistics departments had only less existed less than 100 years, maybe 70 years or so. And applied linguistics are even newer, maybe 50 years. So the disciplines didn't even exist. And yet today, we all practice this and we all replicate this knowledge, which actually is part of the reason that our en environment is degrading and our social structures are collapsing. We see evidence of it everywhere. We just need to open our eyes. So in a sense, we need to get out of this place and to a different place where we can create possibilities. So that is really what my own work recently has been about. Why? Because linguistics have categorized these theories of language, which are essentially anthropocentric, that is human-centric. And my indigenous self rejects anything that is anthropocentric. Anything that is human-centric, whether it, it is linguistics or biology, which also, by the way, does the same thing. Link, biologists do not define life. They talk about the characteristics of living things. And they use those characteristics to create the discipline of biology without defining life. Just like linguists don't define language, they create the discipline of linguistics based on a contrast between human language and non-human communication. That's it. That's how they create the whole discipline, right? When I see that happening, I can, my indigenous roots reject it. I cannot accept it. I have to create something different. I have to go beyond it. And then in applied linguistics, for example, people like Stephen Kreshen, who have had many discussions and debates with, he acknowledges that he hasn't even thought about what language really is. So how can you create a sub-discipline called second language acquisition when you don't really know what language is. And yet, we, it has been created, and so many of us have to take, study it, because that's part of the university curriculum. In my program, we don't teach second language acquisition. We dumped it about 15 years ago, right? Because it just doesn't make sense. And it's essentially a coloniality enabling subdiscipline. So we have to really think about what our programs teach our students and shape our programs and the directions of our programs so that we can come out of these colonial traps and move into a decolonized academia. So I reject these because given these issues, how can we trust this work, right? There is just no evidence for it. And when we reject it, I have to move into thinking perhaps it's time for us to realize that we need a linguistics that is inclusive and based on a broader conceptualization of language as we work together and move forward. So how do I do this? Uh, in terms of language, I sort of start off with talking about four different ways of looking at defining language, right? So notice, traditional linguists don't define language. They start with contrasting human language and non-human communication. I have to, of course, define language. And those of you who work with systemic functional linguistics would know the first one. Uh, that language is a semogenic system, it's a meaning-making system. So whole of systemic functional linguistics, in a sense, is grounded is this definition, right? So Hellidian linguistics does have a definition of language, that it is a semogenic system, which is, means it's just one system. And notice, language, speech, operates only through oral language. Sign language and reading and writing, literacy, are both the aspects of a visual sense. So there are not two modes. There's no modality here. They operate on two different sensory systems. One is a visual sensory system, and the other is an auditory sensory system. They are not two modes. They operate at two different sensory levels. And we'll come back and talk about it in a minute. Language is a socio-semiotic inheritance. I'll go into what I mean by socio-semiotic in just a minute as well. But what I mean really here is that language, our boli, our speech, we learn it from our elders. They learned it from their elders. They learned it from their elders. It's the equivalent of DNA. DNA is our biological heri heritage, right? We get our biology through DNA. But our culture, our beliefs, our ways of being, ways of understanding the world, they all come through social semiotics. And they are also part of our inheritance. So when we disrupt people's languages, either by replacing them or influencing them or changing the categories on those languages, 
We are essentially taking away the socio-semiotic inheritance of these people. Imagine this, if somebody came in and said, if you had material like money-based inheritance, and you were going to inherit, say, 100,000 pounds, that would be very nice, but to inherit 100,000 pounds, and somebody comes in and tries to take it away, you're going to put in a real fight. You'll take them to court because you don't want to lose that money. You don't want to lose the house you're going to inherit. Those are material inheritances. But what about socio-semiotic inheritance? Notice in the world that we live in today, we often give up our own socio-semiotic inheritance. We, are, we give it up in order to acquire a different language, a language of power and dominance. And in doing that, we are giving up our own inheritance willingly. That's a problem, but that's the world we live in, and we need to figure out how to fix that. Because, why? Because of the third definition. Language is science. Let me elaborate. People will say, wait a second, science, how can it be science? Well, it's an interesting way of thinking about it. Because when you think of what science is at the very, very basic level, take away all the methodologies, take away all the applications, and look at the very basis of what science is, science is a system of classification and categorization. It, has the, it carries the classifications and the categories through which we interact and engage and see the world. It is the foundation science, and it is those categories that are then used to create other things. Right? So language evolves over generations in relation to the geography of where people live. And this is why language is very so much, because each group of people do different things with language. They live in different parts of the world. They have different plants. They have different animals. They have different knowledge of how to use the roots of certain trees or flowers of certain trees or the bark of certain trees. That's all knowledge that's part of language. And it's passed on from one generation to another. Right? It's our inheritance. And the fourth definition is that language is a complex dynamic system. Means. It constantly changes. It is fluid. It cannot be defined. And I asked my colleagues who do descriptive linguistics, how can you describe a language? It can't be described. It's constantly shifting and changing. It's a performance. It's a speech. And very often, these descriptive linguists use a written text in order to describe it, whether it's written text itself or they transcribe oral language into writing and then use the writing to to do the codification. That's not language. Language is dynamic, it's constantly shifting. What I'm doing now is language. If you see a recording of it, you watch a recording of it. If you read the notes that somebody has made, then you're reading the notes that somebody has made. Language is a performance in time. It can only be performed in time, it's a performance. It engages all of our sensory systems. It engages all aspects of who we are. So it's, you can't separate out paralinguistics from language, just like you can't separate out human language from non-human communication. We have to look at it, all of these things in togetherness. So having done sort of this work, having sort of thrown away what I grew up myself with, the idea of language and linguistics, my own training in language and linguistics and applied linguistics, having rejected all of it, I have to essentially go back and to ground zero and recreate my understandings of the world and of what language and linguistics are. So to do that, what I have to do in a sense is go back and think about what do we see as the world is, right? So the world is many, many things. The world can be broadly divided between a material biological world, that is the world that we can touch, we can smell, we can taste. We experience the world through our sensory systems, but the world itself is, is a mystery for us. We don't really know what it is. We engage with it through our sensory systems. And, and remember, every human being has a different range of sensory systems, and we use our sensory systems in different ways. And also remember that it's not just us humans that interact with the world and create a life for themselves. 
every living creature does it. Every living creature does it. So every living creature has, is of course a material biological entity like we are. We are a material biological entity and we have sociosemiotics. A duck has its own sociosemiotics, and, but we can't think like a duck. We don't know what they are, but the duck does have it. A cat has it, a dog has it, buffaloes have it, giraffes have it, tigers have it, birds of all kinds have it, everything, insects have it. Why? Because they engage with the world. And in engaging with the world, they have to make sense of the world some, in some ways. Whatever those ways are that they use to make sense of the world is the sociosemiotics. Now, of course, being a human, this is going to be restricted to humans. Now, we can look at it man many different ways. So, for example, uh, material biological is made of matter. It has a physical existence. Sociosemiotics is not. It's not made of matter. It just, it's in our, it's our heads. It exists only within us. Right? Of course, what we know creates our actions which can impact the material world. But they are two different things. Now, interestingly, if you're doing any kind of material sciences, whether it's physics or chemistry or biology, they all, and we even know that the world is created of atoms, right? They're atoms. Now, it's oddly enough, when we talk about social sciences, we don't have a unit of analysis that is comparable to an atom. So that's why sociology will look at things differently. Anthropology will look at things differently. Linguists will do it differently. But if we look at sociosemiotics broadly, all social sciences included here, actually we will realize that it is comprised of non-particles that we can call symbols. All things that are sociosemiotic are comprised of symbols. Whether it is social relationships, whether it is religion, whether it is language, everything. Right? We can use uh, mathematics to study the material biological world. But in social systems, sociosemiotics, mathematics don't operate. They don't work. The existence of the material stuff may or may not be dependent on humans because things can just exist by themselves. Humans don't create it, they, they're just there. Trees are there, right? And of course we can create things as well. So like a cell phone is an invention, a creation of the humans. But for the sociosemiotics, its existence is dependent on humans. If there are no humans, there are no human sociosemiotics because it's what we have in our minds. Material world may exist without sociosemiotics, right? So they can have objects that doesn't have a sociosemiotic itself. Wood doesn't have it. All living things have it. But sociosemiotics cannot exist without the material biological. Right? Because the sociosemiotics are contained within the material biological. They are not external. To make a change in the material biological world, we need to take action. There has to be material force used. To make changes in the sociosemiotic world, we don't need a material force. That's a pretty interesting thing. And that gives us hope because we can actually change this. Changes are influenced by principles of material and biological world. But in the sociosemiotic systems, change can occur at any time for any reason. That's why language can change any time for any reason. We don't know. It just changes. Our beliefs can change at any point in time. Our ways of doing things can shift all the time. We don't even know why that happens. It just happens. Right? And within a university, notice, we create a division where we think, study physics and chemistry and biology and sort of you know, engineering and science and disciplines. And then we study things like linguistics and sociology and economics and religious studies in sort of arts and social sciences. That distinction, notice, is based on how we differentiate things. But also notice that all of these things, whether it's sociology or economics, guess what, money operates as a symbol, right? Everything that is sociosemiotic operates through symbols, all of them. So in a sense, we don't need all these disciplines. We just need one. We just need one discipline that looks at all these aspects, whether it's a social aspect, whether it's an economic aspect, because all of this operates through symbols and through symbolic systems. But unfortunately, in academia at the moment, 
we don't have some kind of a unified way of looking at social sciences. So I'm projecting it, I'm, I'm pro suggesting that we can actually do it. Just like people work with atoms, whether they're doing biology or chemistry or physics, we can work with symbols regardless of what field we are focused on. And by doing that, just like in the sciences, they can actually create things that are useful. Maybe social scientists can also create things that are more useful than they are at the moment. That is my own work, that is what I push, and I'll give you examples of how I do it, because it can be done. Now, before I talk about those things, I want to take a few more minutes and talk about our sensory systems, because of course, we connect the sociosemiotics, so our beliefs and our perceptions, and our engagement with the material world. Of course, we do both. We do it through our sensory systems. And as I said, humans, at the most, can have five sensory systems. Right? I like to divide these sensory systems. We all know what they are. We've all learned about them from our childhood. But what I'm proposing here is a sequencing and a grouping. So I group sight and sound as group A, and I separate out smell, touch, and taste as group B. Now the sequencing is very important here. It's extremely important, and I'll explain why through examples in a second. But just to look at what they are. So because sight and sound can be relatively distant, sight and sound can be in our present, or they can be displaced. So all of us who have had Zoom experiences, we are, when we do a Zoom talk, we are actually not sharing space. Right? We're not sharing space. So I don't know where my students are or my participants are, and my participants don't know where I am. We don't have shared space because sight can be displaced. Sound can be displaced. These can be recorded. They can be put into words. So reading, for example, is sight, and it is a displacement because what you're reading is not observable. Right? So anytime you have no, you're doing sight or sound in a displaced way, essentially we are living in a non-observable world. But at the same time, sight and sound operate in the presence. And they make a huge difference, right? So for example, I can see you, you can see me, and we share the same space. So if I say to you, there are three blue chairs in the front, you will say, wait a second, nah. Is he gone blind? Is he color blind? Can you not see? Or is he trying to trick me? Or is he making a joke? You're going to ask all these things, there becomes all possibles because you can observe that these are not the blue chairs. Your eyes can, can, can tell you that. But if I'm in a Zoom session and if I'm recording and that's not there and I say to my, my participants, there are three ch blue chairs in the room. There is no way that they can actually know. They don't know. The only way they can accept it is if they believe me. They put their trust in me. Now, if they put their trust in me and I'm telling them the truth and I don't have any intentions of controlling them or lying to them or deceiving them, and I tell them, you know, they're red, I guess, some range of red, then they believe me, they can still be misled, they can still be tricked because they might interpret it differently because red actually is a, very, is a broad shade of a spectrum of color. You know, red can be a lot of things for different things, people, right? So that still can be tricked a bit, but at least I'm not trying to deceive them. But if I do it deliberately in order to deceive them, I say there are three blue chairs, now they have, they, and they have believed me, now they have believed in a falsehood. And everything that build, build beyond that is it based on that falsehood. And therefore, it's not right. Because it's based on stuff that isn't. Right? Now notice, displacements operate through sight and sound only. We cannot have displacements in smell, touch, and taste. If something smells bad, it smells bad. There is no displacement, there's no fooling, because it's always, always, always in your present. You can't be fooled. If, if you look at something and, and you taste it and you don't like it, you don't like it. it it's no good, it, the taste doesn't taste good. There's no, no questioning it. Now, of course, some people may say, I like it and you don't like it, that's possible. But if I don't like it, I don't like it, period. 
There's no fooling me. Also notice, I might think about food and I can think about what I had for dinner last night and I can remember the taste of it, but the taste is not in my mouth anymore and I cannot recreate it. But with sight and sound, both of those things are possible. So that's why, for example, the examples that I gave you from the linguistics book and how they separate human language and non-human communication, that's based on a falsehood. But it's repeated so many times and it comes in through academia and we have to take tests in it, we have to write papers on it, we have to do term papers, we do additional research on it, that it becomes a reality for us, it becomes a sociosemiotic belief for us, even though it's based on a falsehood. That can only exist if we are learning through displacements. Now, indigenous education was never displaced. It was always in place. And it was always done by experts who knew what they were doing. Because if you're not an expert, why would I go and learn from you? Why would your parents, what would, would my parents send me to somebody who doesn't know how to perform? Right, so imagine if I want to learn how to make a boat or a bow and arrow or a spear, my parents are going to send me to somebody who knows how to make good spears. So I can learn from them by watching them, by, by training by them. I will not be sent to somebody who cannot make spears. But think of the world we live in today. We all take classes in academic writing. But how many people who teach those classes in academic writing can actually do academic writing themselves? Right? They can't do academic writing, and yet they're teaching academic writing. Wait a second, how can that happen? That can only happen when you have a displaced world. So we always need to keep in mind the idea of being placed, what it is that we are doing, how are we engaging our sensory systems? Are we in place or are we being displaced? If we are being displaced, what other evidence do we have to support what we are reading or watching. You know, as linguists and applied linguists, we know how, for example, media, you know, media can deceive us all the time. It positions it at us in different ways. We know that, right? Because that's, that's part of what we do in critical discourse analysis. Media does this. But at the same, why it can do it? It can do it because it operates through sight and sound. Anything that operates in displacement is a potential trap for us. Now, I said to you this sequencing is important, so let me just give you one example because I do want to move on. <clears throat> right? Think about it in terms of human relationships. Just because I can see people outside and I know that they are humans, well, they are humans, or that's it. I don't know them. But if I stop and I start talking to them, then I start to get to know them but I still just don't know them casually. I don't know them really well. Now, if I'm talking to them, I feel that they smell bad, I will move away. I won't build my relationship with them, right? I will have that interaction and I'll leave. And I might not see them again. But if they're normal human beings, they're clean, they're presentable, that's fine. Now, if my culture allows it, if it's possible, then if I have a close relationship with somebody, I might touch them. I might give them a hug. But that's only happening with certain people. That tells us there's a closer relationship now. And guess what? We only share taste with our intimates, right? We don't share taste with others. So this also brings us into looking at how human relationships are formed. This is part of the reason that a child-mother relationship is amongst the strongest bonds in the world, because they share all five senses. Now, by understanding all of this, I have sort of started saying, all right, so this is something that all human beings really have automatically. They grow up with this. I mean, I'm sort of theorizing a little bit, but we all have it, because we are human beings. Or what, how, what range we have might vary. So in applying this back into applied linguistics and linguistics, I have to rethink how I will do that. So I started developing something I call subaltern linguistics. What is subaltern linguistics? Subaltern linguistics is linguistics carried out, carried out by and for a community's self-empowerment, well-being and prosperity. 
Subaltern linguistics can be done by anyone in any language. It does not use or rely on English or on technical jargon. I'll give you examples of how we can do it in a second. And the goal of subaltern linguistics is to create economies. Imagine this, language experts are creating economies. I'll give you an example of it. Practices that don't exist, projects, resources that don't exist, creating them, right? They can be made by the community and then used by the community, and both by members and the leaders, in order to promote them, their own benefits, in order to take care of themselves. So essentially decolonizing linguistics and enabling people to use it, the resources for themselves. Now, how do I do it? I do it by operationalizing it in many different ways. One of the ways I do it is by calling something called the credible approach. And what is the credible approach? I've now, notice I've used the word credible, like, you know, you've heard the word reliability and validity, right? All of you who have done research, you have reliability measures and you have validity measures in any kind of research. What I say, yes, those things are useful, but they're only useful if your project is credible. If your project is not credible, then I don't care about the reliability coefficient. It makes no difference because the project itself is not credible. So credibility for me comes first. Now, what is credible? It's an acronym. It's contextually relevant. So it has to think, we think locally. It responds to a practical need. It's not based on finding a gap in the research literature. I don't care about finding the gap in the literature. That's not a starting point for me because that is actually just reference based. It's not based on observation and practice. So I have to think of a real world need, a real world issue, and then trying to respond to it. Now in doing that, I need to engage stakeholders because I'm doing it with people and for the people. I'm not a researcher going in and collecting data. They are not my participants. I'm not doing surveys. I'm, they're not my participants. They are the stakeholders because what we are creating, what we are building, is for them and me. And so we have to work on it together, all of it. It draws on understanding of the local knowledge and practices, because things won't work if we don't know what the local is. But of course, at the same time, it's informed by diverse approaches and experiences, which includes academic knowledge. I'm not going to say not to include it, but it's only one thing that we include we have to look at it much more broadly and we have to go beyond just the Western canons. Because maybe we'll find something that's really good in Kenya, but we won't look at there because we're only focused on English-based academic knowledge published in these top tier journals, right? We have to get out of that space. And it has to benefit the local communities. Without benefit, there's no point doing it. Why do we spend four years of our, of, our, of our lives writing a dissertation that nobody other than our supervisor and maybe the examiners will read? What's the point of doing it? Right? We could spend the same four years creating the resources that our community needs. So instead of thinking about we do a, a policy analysis of what bilingual resources are available in X place or Y place, that's just a dissertation. Nobody if, does it, reads it, and even if they read it, it's not going to change anything. What if we spend the same three years or four years for creating the resources, creating them, because they don't exist, we know that. Create the resources and then document how you created them. That's also a dissertation. And that dissertation is based on pro cre creation of things. And what you have now created is a resource that the community can use. It's a real world resource. Right? And by doing all of this, guess what? You automatically sort of lead the discipline. Of course, and this is all done ethically. And ethics here is more than just consent forms. Now, I am aware that I have to end in about 10 minutes, so that's all right. So I will go through two examples, and I will share their, where they are so you can explore them yourselves. So the first one is the FLC, the Free Linguistics Conference Language Travels. Now the FLC itself is a whole credible project that I've been working on for the last 16 years, right? I've been building it and building it and building it, right? And, and I'll talk about the language travels because what we did was we created an economy and an indigenous language. And we cre created and published resources in that language. And that, that whole project, even though FLC has moved away from there, 
they, people are still doing it. They generated income for themselves every couple of months by carrying out these programs. And they have the projects and the material to do this, right? And we, I'll talk to you about the Ribbit Ribbit Pond, which is a translingual children's storybook. It's illustrated in 26 languages, plus learning and teaching material for at least three of other languages. So Language Travels was in Malacca. And get, look at this. It's the children of the community who became the teachers. So the children whose language is vulnerable learn their language from their elders and then they teach it to the, to the tourists, to the travelers, language travelers, because the language travelers are there to learn the language. Now in doing all of this, it's, it's, it's was a lot of fun, of course, right? But more importantly than, than that, what we realized that the children who were involved in this project, some of them were in deep trouble in their own schools. They were in performing well in their schools. But after engaging in the language travels, their whole attitude to life changed because they were empowered, their language was empowered, they were able to create resources that were published by the University of Malaya Press, and these resources now exist. And the community runs the language travels every once in a mile. They had to stop because of COVID, and now they're restarting, right? And when they bring the, the people, language travelers, to the community, they support the language local businesses, they lo support the local restaurants, everything gets supported. So in a sense, through this little project, we, can, we, we are not documenting the language per se, but we are enabling and empowering this indigenous language. Another example is the Ribbit Ribbit Pond. Now let me show you what the Ribbit Ribbit Pond is. Uh, again, you can look at it in more detail yourself, but I do want to read it. Uh, notice it is in 26 languages. You can choose no language, or you can choose any of these languages, right? So you can, let's say here, let's have a shared language is English, so let's have English. I would love to have an Irish version. So if somebody wants to translate it, we will upload the Irish version as well. And then let's go, you can choose any other. Let's say, I know there's quite a few Indonesian students here, so let's say Indonesian. New Philippine. Make it big. So this story is dedicated to all refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants who have left their home countries in pursuit of a brighter future. And to those people who embrace cultural diversity and try to make this world a better place for everyone. Last spring, a group of croc croc frogs arrived at the ribbit ribbit pond. They came from a faraway land, from the mountains and beyond. They traveled day, they traveled night. In the rain, in the sun. Until they finally found a new home at the Ribbit Ribbit Pond. Now I'm going to stop there and I'll let you guys read this on your own later because it's, it's a beautiful little book. You can already see the possibilities that you have to use this book in various contexts, in education, in classrooms, in so many places. Now what I will also show you is that it's not just the book. Now, this was created by a master's student, right? This was his master's thesis project. And then he wrote his dissertation on how he created this. That was his master's thesis. How did he do this? And I'll show you how, what he wrote in that dissertation. Here, the, this is the making of the Ribbit Ribbit Pond. Stop, sorry, I went to the wrong one. And uh, just looking at this thing section here. Notice he doesn't have chapters. His dissertation doesn't have chapters. Gosh, there is no literature review. There's no methodology chapter. Why? Why do we need them? We can recreate the genres of a dissertation to serve the needs of the projects. And in doing that, notice he's got units and lessons. He's talking about what he learned, what he did, and then he's got activities He's got activities for you to, as a reader, when you're reading his dissertation, he's telling you to do these activities. The whole genre can shift. And by doing that, he's actually teaching you how to make a book like the Ribbit Ribbit Pond. 
So if you want to make a children's illustrated storybook, what do you do? How do you do it? By reading this dissertation, you can learn how to do it. Right? It becomes a tool that others can really use in their life. Right? So I wanted to give you these two examples. And I wanted to share another book which uh, Mel was very generously also mentioned in the introduction. Now, I don't, I don't I say that I published this book because I've never published it and I probably never will. All I did was I released it. I released this book on academia.edu. And by releasing this book on academia.edu, instead of publishing through the traditional sources, the book becomes instantly available and accessible to anybody in the world with no cost. Right, so we know, for example, a lot of really good books, we, are, we can't access them because of the cost of the book. But by shifting that, we can change all of this. But at the same time, I am also aware that we need to create alternative ways for our larger audience and our postgraduate students and others to be able to publish and do things. So I'm just starting off a new project with Routledge. And this is a new t way of creating an encyclopedia. It's called English in the Real World, which is going to be based on evidence. And notice the kind of themes that we are looking at. Migration, politics, uh, sports, tourism, workplace, entertainment, healthcare. We're looking at real world context, real world uses of where English is used in multilingual contexts. Looking at the linguistic diversity and the uh, linguistic ecology of the area and then putting it all together and turning it into a new kind of an encyclopedia. So this is something that's going to be starting to come out in the next three to four years. But again, it's building on the principles. It's, it's a, sort of abandoning some of the old thinking and rethinking and recreating new genres. So I actually invite people here and other places, people to join me in this team because we're still building the team. We're still looking for people to work together to create this. We are going to recreate the genres redesign everything, because we can. There's nothing stopping us. Right, and just like I started with a poem, I'll end with a poem. Come, nomad, you have seen enough. Unharnessed greed runs over the world like a polluted river is spreading as she flows. Come, nomad, you have heard enough. Unashamed voices sing songs of lies full of rhymes that silence sounds of pain. Come, nomad, you have learned enough. Now walk toward the place of possibility where we can contribute to create harmony. And I invite you all to walk with me on this journey. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I think, do we have QA? Yeah. Mel? Uh, yeah. Is this working? Did it work? Uh, thank you very much, Sunny Boy. If anyone has questions for Sunny Boy, please come up here to the microphone so he can hear your question. Uh, we've got maybe... 10, almost 15 minutes. Yes, can you come up to the microphone? I don't know if I can. Do I dare take this off the stand? There you go. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, thanks so much for this fascinating talk and for the possibilities you've shown us. That was really the, the most fascinating about this, how we can do things differently and how we can look sort of beyond the pond, I guess. Um, I, I think the, the children's book is especially fascinating because um, I have kids and, um, and I think kids are really still open to language and diversity and um, multilingualism and that, you know, we all are different and we may speak differently. Um, my question is about having language from your elders and I don't know whether that's a little bit narrow, because I would argue that we have language from the people we communicate with, and in a lot of situations, 
that happens to be our elders. But if we look at, for example, Nicaraguan sign language, where there weren't any elders, right? The kids created the language themselves because they wanted to communicate. So I guess my question is, to what extent can we expand on that definition of where we get language from? And in a lot of communities, it's probably a lot from our elders. But um, even if, if I look at sort of European language acquisition context, so my language has been influenced by our kids because they talk in a certain way with their peers and they bring that home and some of that we adopt, right? So if, if you can comment on that. Absolutely. That uh, notice those are four interrelated definitions and one of them is that language is a complex dynamic system, right? And it's a, it's a semogenic system and so in the semogenic system, I think I specifically mentioned that sign language is an aspect of it, right? So absolutely, these are four interrelated ways of looking at it. It's not saying that language is just this, right? So yeah. Absolutely, I agree. So we have to look at it in, in complex ways, in multiple ways. Mm -hmm. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. If you can't hear me up there, if you can't hear me up there, <laughs> there are microphones up there as well. If you're in the balcony and you'd like to ask a question, please just come forward to the microphone and we'll, we'll hold some time for you. Uh, just Pal Singh from the Open University. Thank you so much for this for this talk. It was really, really inspiring. Um, at the beginning, you you made a distinction between modality and senses, and I didn't quite get that. Why are you you refusing the notion of modality? Could you comment on that a bit more? Sure. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, it's right here. See, because visual re literacy, reading and writing, operate through the sight. Right? And oral language or speech or boli, which is called boli, operate through sound. These are two, sense, two different sensory systems. So for example, somebody who's deaf and mute can still read and write. And, and, you know, and somebody, they can still do uh, sign language because it's all visual. And, but somebody who doesn't have sight cannot read or write. They may not be able to do sign language, but they can still speak, right? And they can listen. So what we can see is that they're not two modes, they're two sensory systems. They're often confused at it. Now, this is a, actually relatively modern, modern confusion. So if you look at saussure, for example, people often talk about saussure's four dichotomies or complementarities. There's actually a fifth one, which is actually very important, which is excluded from all these books. Saussure was very clear that speech and writing are two different things. He never confused it. They work together, yes, but one is a visual representation of the other, right? So writing is a visual representation to a degree of sound, but that's only the case in certain languages, right? So when we look at the writing systems, we can look at writing systems in two main ways. There are writing systems that are based on sound, and writing systems that are based on sound, we can distinguish at least two different types. Those that are phonetic, which is one sound, one character, like English, right? Like my language, Urdu. Or you can have writing systems which a whole syllable is captured by a character, right? So syllabic writing systems, so you've got the Japanese, right? So you can see that the, even with, when the writing systems that are dependent on sound, there are two different, ways, but we can also have writing systems that is not dependent on sound at all. The only language that does that today is Chinese, right? That is why the, why it, that the Chinese conceptualized language and dialect is very different from European ways of doing it. And the reason is because language is seen as a combination of speech and writing, right? And the writing system for them is a visual system that is not based on phonology. And the dialect is only and only over ever oral. So when you look at the right Chinese characters, you can pronounce them and you can read them in Shanghainese, you can read them in Ningbonese, you can read them in Cantonese, you can even read them in Japanese, right? You're not bound by the phonology. Now, if we look at this, you can also see, start to then evaluate the, the benefits of it. 
right? If, if we, our writing system is not based on sounds, but they're based on meaning, then it becomes a unifying thing. It unifies the people. Whereas writing systems that are phonetic, which is what linguists create, by the way, they go out and create all these phonetic-based systems, horrible, right? In fact, they, they replace syllabic systems with in, uh, phonetic systems in places like Indonesia and the Philippines, right? They're, they're the worst kind of writing systems because every time you change your phonology, your spellings will shift. Now, this is part of the reason why, except, for example, black kids in the US or other minorities in other parts of the English-speaking world don't do well in literacy because they write with their speech and they spell differently. And that spelling and that grammar is not recognized. And so therefore they get penalized and they get punished, right? So that's actually a really bad way of doing writing. And yet we do it, right? So this is again part of the sets of confusions that people have. But if we move away from it and we start looking at it through a sensory system experience, then we start to find ways to move away from where we are stuck. Does that answer your question? Sure. <laughs> You can find him after the presentation and follow up. <laughs> Any other questions? We have time for maybe one more question or a provocative comment. Great. Thank you very much. It was a very fascinating talk. And I actually have a question re uh, regarding the first example you gave from Urdu, the word boli. And I'm wondering, um, linguistics as a body of knowledge, applied linguistics and other branches as well, is probably, I'm using the word probably, but it's based on European uh, languages, the conceptualizations and wordings and uh, terminologies. So would you say that the body of knowledge, just as an example, the word boli, for instance, it would be a different uh, body of knowledge if it was conceptualized and looked from different angles of uh, other languages from global south for instance absolutely right language is at the basis that gives you the categories and the classification systems so when you use english based classification systems which is essentially in a lot of the world because the english colonized a lot of the world a lot of the laws and the policies and the all of the socialist structures are grounded in English-based classifications. That has been devastating for communities. So one of the papers I think I, I mentioned here, uh, uh, this one, oh, sorry, yes. This particular paper actually talks about it in detail. It's World English's Social Disharmonization and Environmental Destruction. Right, so I'll give you a quick example. So in the part of the world that I'm from, which is South Asia, broadly speaking, we had a three gender classification system. Had a three gender classification system. Because we didn't use a structure to identify two genders. We looked at the sociology to identify three genders. Now in 1860s, the British passed a law through which they criminalized, they criminalized the third gender. Because in English, there is a two gender classification system. They don't see a third gender. So by doing that in 1860s, they essentially took away the right of inheritance, the right of employment, and the dignity of the third gender. Those third gender people became what are known as hijras today, street side beggars, prostitutes. That's an application, that's a consequence of an application of an English-based category system onto a community that had a different way of categorizing gender, right? That's the kind of problems that can arise with it. So you're absolutely right. When we theorize in our own bully, whatever your bully is, you will come to a different understanding of the very discipline that you practice. But because we are all trained through English linguistics and human language and non-human communication, and then guess what? We translate this work into our languages. We are imposing the categories of English onto our languages. And then our people don't know what the differences are anymore 
because we're just using stuff in our own language that actually is not our language. It's all translated. That creates the problems, a huge set of problems. So you're absolutely right. And I think we, it's extremely important that we theorize based on our own bully, on our own speech, not writing, our own speech. Think of our own categories. Try to understand the world geographically through observation. As I said, through in the credible approach, I used references, but that's just one aspect of it. I definitely don't get my students to start their PhD or their master's thesis with a find the gap, never. You look at the literature once you have already identified the issues you're working with in order to learn about the problems that you're dealing with. So you're actually engaging with the literature in a very different way. So by changing that and I, I, I actively engage with them to encourage them to think about these things in their own language, even if I don't understand that language, allows them to do it. And I'm always surprised by how clever they are when they're allowed to do that. And a student, a master's student, who wanted to do a study on the attitudes towards minority languages, ended up writing this beautiful and illustrated picture book, right? That's the kind of things they can create. Only if we give them the room to allow, and allow them to bring their creativity and, and ways of thinking into the discourses of academia. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you very, very much. I think that this talk has really set the scene for asking all of us to stretch ourselves over the next couple of days as we listen to each other's papers, engage with each other's work, and um, kind of reconnect with one another in the field. So thank you very, very much, Sunny Boy. We hope you stick around for the next couple <laughs> days and, and engage with all of us. Absolutely. So next, Sultan, do I just give this to you? Oh, I don't know. You do it. Well, our parallel sessions start at 11.30 as uh, per the program. Um, uh, please make yourselves, um, well, make your way to the Peter Froggett Center. Um, our volunteers are stationed. They will be able to, there are signs. They will be able to direct you to Peter Froggett Center. It's just a two minute walk from here. Um, and we have lunch back here at Whitla Hall. Um, there are chairs and tables um, outside. It's a sunny day, sunny boy, sunny day. <laughs> uh, so uh, we, we should take <coughs> advantage of it and, and have our lunch outside, right? After we do two sets of, of papers um, um, from colleagues who are here to present their work, yeah? Okay, thank you so much, thank you.